Good afternoon, everyone, and thanks for joining us. My name is Karen Chalmers, and I'm the Vice President here at Tech Alliance. As the Regional Innovation Centre for Southwestern Ontario, Tech Alliance empowers world-class ventures and fuels growth in Canada's innovation economy. We champion and coach entrepreneurs, amplify and impact businesses, and contribute to a bold technology community across the region. We are the place for dreamers, innovators, and world-changing ideas. In pursuit of creating spaces where innovation thrives, we must act and be bold and lift others while we rise. We strive to do that in all that we do here at Tech Alliance. To simply put, to put it simply, we support entrepreneurs and ventures at every step of their entrepreneurial journey. If you'd like to engage with our venture growth team, read stories about innovation that's shaping the community with world-changing ideas, or join other upcoming experiences, I invite you to subscribe to our newsletter in the chat here. Acknowledging the stolen land upon which Tech Alliance sits is merely a starting point. As settlers, it's imperative to honor the region's First Nations and all the peoples of, of Turtle Island, to recognize the trauma, genocide, and history of Indigenous people. This land is a traditional territory of the Anishinaabe, the Haudenosaunee, the Lenape, the Attawandaron, and the Wendat. To advance truth and reconciliation, our team is committed to continued learning and advocacy and actively working alongside Indigenous-led businesses and entrepreneurs. Before we get this masterclass started, a few housekeeping points. All the participants' microphones are muted, so please relax and enjoy. Today's masterclass will be recorded and available for replay on our YouTube channel, and I encourage you to add any questions in the Q&A feature at the bottom of your screen and please add comments to our active chat feature. So to get this conversation going, pop into the chat, what are your biggest sales challenges? Now I have the distinct privilege to introduce Justine Tyndall, who will be leading us through our learning today and also hosting 15 minute consultations tomorrow from nine to 12. So use the link in the chat for you to register for your one-on-one -on -one time with Justine. Trust me, it'll be worth it. Justine is the Vice President of Operations for Sandler Training for the GTA and the Golden Horseshoe. She guides entrepreneurs in every industry to improve their marketing and sales, prospecting, appointment setting, referral development, seminar systems, and client retention strategies. With over 10 years of experience with Sandler and sales training, Justine knows the importance of working smart and doing it right the first time. Justine's got a track record of helping business owners increase closing ratios, booking appointments with decision makers, filling their pipeline and selling. And we are thrilled to have her here with us today and share her system for success. So Justine, I'm gonna hand it over to you now to lead us to this masterclass of upgrading your B2B sales. Thanks for being here. Thanks so much, Karen. That was an awesome introduction. I really like that too. you uh, talked about the obvious, which is uh, about the Indigenous people. So I'm part, uh, I have that in my background, so I do appreciate that. So uh, yeah, everyone, thank you for joining me here today. So today's discussion is B2B sales, right? That's what we're here to talk about. So as Karen said, please definitely participate in the chat. Um, we're here to engage, uh, we're here to learn from each other, and we only have about an hour, which is like a glitch in time, so let's really use this time well, okay? All right, well, um, so basically, why don't I just set a bit of an agenda for this uh, meeting? So in this hour, I'm going to be discussing some of the common sales challenges that most, uh, many sales leaders um, and their salespeople or individual salespeople face on a day-to-day -day basis. So um, hopefully uh, you can get some learning out of this. And at the end of this discussion, if you could just leave with one takeaway, one thing that you can apply in your business in the next 30, 60, 90 days that would make a change, then my, uh, my goal has been achieved. So I'm here to make, make you um, open some eyes a bit and also help to drive revenue. So that's what we're here to do. We're here to help you drive revenue. So uh, without further ado, let's, uh, let's just kick it off, right? So uh, in today's discussion, we are talking about um, B2B sales, business to business sales, and specifically 
the, the topic that I'm going to be talking about is what we call the buyer seller dance, which is the relationship between the buyer and the seller and what goes on in that dance. So just a little bit of background on, on Sandler training. This isn't to any type of sales pitch or sell. It's just to help you understand where we're getting this da data from. So Sandler is the largest sales training, uh, sales management training, customer service, enterprise sales training organization in the world. So we're working with business owners anywhere from small, medium-sized owners, where it could just be a sole practitioner with maybe some support staff, all the way up to Fortune 100 companies where there's multiple sale, multiple decision maker, makers, multiple offices, complicated selling, where they could have thousands of people in their company scattered across the nation. So bottom line, Sandler Training, we're in over, we have 250 offices worldwide. You can see on the screen, we operate in over 300 uh, different industries, 30 different countries, 20 different languages, over 30,000 trainees trained a year with a main focus um, though we operate in over 300 different industries, we are the main focus is anything that has to do with IT, software, tech, that's one, financial services, that's another, manufacturing, building, and design and construction. So although we service many areas, we're specifically, we're, we're really kind of digging deep into the IT, technology, software, SaaS, VAR kind of uh, arena right now. So, and another reason why I wanted to bring up this topic is not to sell, but just to show you that we are pulling data from many different offices around the world. We've been in business for over 60 years. So we're getting data, we're pulling from many different resources to get this information. And that's uh, all I wanted to say. And if you want to shoot me an email after this discussion, like uh, Karen said, we have an opportunity to book a, a training session one-on-one -on -one after this, or you can shoot me an email and uh, visit our website if, if you're curious. But uh, let's get into the real good stuff. I'm not going to bore you with what Sandler training is. Um, now, one more thing. I did want to show you this sample client list to show you that, yes, we are working with some of the top companies in the world, Salesforce.com, Gong, Oracle, HubSpot. The reason why I'm showing you this list is, yes, as we noticed, these are massive companies, right? Are they, these are massive companies, massive companies, multiple offices all around the world. But you'd be surprised how similar the sales challenges in these companies are to the sales challenges in small, medium-sized owner-managed firms, right? So they're facing very similar challenges as, say, a sole practitioner, a startup, or a founder is facing. The salespeople and the sales managers are facing very similar challenges in these massive organizations as they are in small, medium-sized organizations. So how do we get the most out of this session? Participate. So you don't want to hear me drone on. I want to. I want some participation. You guys and gals are, are leaders in your organizations. No doubt you're going to have a lot of really good insight. And chances are, if you have a question, someone else is probably thinking the same question too. So there's no dumb question. Actually, the only dumb question is the one that you don't ask. So feel free to, in the chat, chat's being monitored, so participate, right? So we want you to immerse yourself in the, the, the learning materials. Also take notes. This, uh, this recording is gonna be posted later on for you to view, but take notes and really focus on your mindset. In, during this session, really, what is my mindset? What is my feeling state, my mindset as this is going through? Okay. And of course, we want you to be able to not only learn these techniques, but actually apply them, practice them, implement them today, starting today. Okay. And of course, have fun. That's what we're here to do. Well, that's at least what I'm here to do, to have fun. Right. So that's, uh, that's what we want to do in this session. All right. So now, what types of selling are we talking about in this discussion? So we are talking about enterprise selling. Now, when you think of enterprise selling, that sounds kind of scary. Like, hey, I'm, I'm not, maybe some of you aren't doing enterprise selling. Maybe this is not something that you are involved in. But enterprise selling is not just massive organizations, right? What defines enterprise selling, this could also be small, medium-sized organizations. So you, as the, as the owners, founders, you are selling to companies that are either small, medium-sized, all the way up to large enterprise, but there is an element of enterprise within small, medium-sized companies, right? So what is enterprise selling? Let's, let's define what enterprise selling is. 
enterprise, enterprise selling is extended sales cycles, long sales cycles, right? Enterprise selling is multiple decision makers, complicated sales, right? Even if you're selling widgets, even if you're selling uh, brick and mortar products, when it comes to enterprise selling, these, these are some of the elements that are involved. Specifically where in enterprise selling, we're focusing on value. We're not pushing commodities. The, we're not racing to the bottom. We're selling value. And that's what a lot of you, you all are doing today, I would assume. You're selling value, right? So if you're selling value, then this focus needs to be on value because you are dealing with sophisticated competition. You are up against very sophisticated competition. So the, the ability to focus on value is really important, right? So let's go through this. So extended sales cycle, uh, focusing on value, sophisticated competition, wide diverse buyer networks, where the companies that you're selling to are investing significant amounts into pursuits, as well as the sellers, you're investing significant amount into your pursuits, complex decision-making processes, cross-functional sales teams. This is a really important one. So for instance, you may have people that are in not a direct selling role, but if they're in some type of customer sales role, they have the ability to ask the client further questions to find out if there's more buying opportunity. And same with the person that you're selling to. They have cross-functional buying teams, right? And of course, they are these companies and you yourself, you're leaving a footprint, right? So this is what enterprise selling is. And that's kind of the focus of this discussion today. It's the value selling. All right. Next slide. Okay. So my first question for you all today is, and I'm really looking forward to your answers, and you can type this in the chat. I would be able to close more business after making a demo presentation or proposal if only finish the sentence. So I would be able to close more business after making a demo presentation and proposal if only. So I'll give you a few seconds to finish the sentence. Okay. So a couple more. So Dave says if if they responded to emails, he'd be able to he'd be able to close more business after the demo. If all the Emily's saying if all the decision makers were in the room, I would be able to absolutely I would be able to close more business, right? Okay. So anyone else? These are also these are all very important items. Okay. One more. Let's see who's got one more. So. Harley's saying if, 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 if had an easier means of customer acquisition, okay, you'd be able to close more business if you were able to get more customers. If you can, Taha is saying if I can create the need in my client. Okay, all right, that's good. Thank you for that. Okay, so that said, the buyer-seller relationship. This talk is called the buyer-seller dance. Why is it called the buyer seller dance? Well, picture a slow dance, will you? When you're when you're having a nice slow dance, what happens? One person has to take the lead, right? Right? When you're doing a slow dance, there's got to be one person who takes the lead. What happens if both people take the lead in the dance? You can throw this in the chat. What happens when both people take the lead in a slow dance? Well, let me save some time. What happens is it's probably uncoordinated. It's probably clumsy, right? It doesn't really work out. You can't really have two people leading a dance. Otherwise, it's basically going to crash and burn, right? You're going to be stepping on each other's toes. It's just not going to go well, right? So this is also relevant when you're having sales conversations, right? You got conflicting agendas. There's the agenda of, this, of the meeting, the, the seller's agenda, and then there's the buyer's agenda, right? Because if you had two people taking the lead in the sales conversation, you're going to be bumping heads, right? Because of the agenda of the prospect is they want to know everything that the seller has. But for some reason, the agenda of the, the seller is they want to ask questions. They need to find out some, some basic information 
to answer, to be able to determine if they have what you have. So if if one person needs question needs to get all the answers, but the other person needs to first ask questions, you know, there, there, there's going to be a conflict. So you want to, we, you want to make sure that when it comes to sales conversations, yes, one person has to take the lead and guess who's that's going to be. It's going to be the seller. So the seller has to take the lead and, and we'll, we'll talk about what that means. Right. So what is your sales process? My question, my question for you all, what is your sales process? Right. Oftentimes when I ask this to salespeople and business owners, they kind of struggle with an answer, right? They struggle. They, they either don't know their sales process or they do know their sales process, but they can't really define it. Or maybe they do know their actual sales process and maybe they can define it. But oftentimes is when I ask a seller what their sales process is, they often say, I don't really know. I just kind of do it, right? Now that may work for a lot of people. That may work for a lot of people but actually it doesn't work for some people. And the same with a buyer. When I ask a buyer, what is your buying process? They also don't really know, right? They don't really know. So this specific process that you're looking at and that we're talking about, this is, by the way, this is for when you're actually going after new logos. So this is the proactive selling process that we're talking about. This is being proactive where you're selling value, you're going out to look for new logos. This isn't so much for, for taking orders or doing off quick quotes. That's not what we're talking about. So look at, let's look at the typical selling order. That's this, right? This is what 99% of salespeople do. So what do they do? They set up a meeting, right? First thing is, and by the way, tell me, type in the chat, if this is drastically different than your sales process. So the first thing they do is they set up a meeting right here. They set up a meeting to see if they can do some type of high level needs analysis, right? So they're going to find out what their problems are. Everyone knows that, right? The, the, the basic first step is to find out what their needs are, what their problems are, right? And this needs analysis, by the way, this can be this can be through a, a number of meetings, right? This can also be trying to get this in needs analysis. That can be a number of meetings, emails going back and forth, you know, uh, between multiple people, you know, trying to connect with multiple people. But bottom line is this basic standard process is to find uh, ask enough information from the sale from the from the buyer so that the salesperson you gets the impression that and this is a, enough information that I have now I can make a presentation right so they get enough information to get a presentation right so so they so they found out basic uh, problems they 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 said they what they want to solve so this is good enough so let's let's do a presentation Let's do a demo, right? Let's put let's put a quote together. That's what this is, okay? Then, so they put the presentation on. They they they're either in a meeting or they're they're sending it through email. They put the quote together, right? So then, what do they they do? Typical process is they they go to attempt to get commitment or attempt to close, right? But let's use attempt to obtain commitment. So the seller they they put on this presentation. Now they're going to go try to get commitment from the buyer, right? So they attempt to close. And often sales leaders will say, if I could just get my people to ask for the sale, we would close more business, right? So that's kind of what this is. Why are my people not asking for the business? Right? So that's kind of here what they're doing. So they're attempting to close. Then what they do is after they, oh, yeah, the, the sales, the, the buyer, this is great. This is great. So then what they attempt to, attempt to do after that, the seller does is they attempt to handle objections, right? So they're gonna handle objections, answer any questions that the, the buyer has uh, about, about the presentation, about the proposal. They're gonna handle any objections that they have and uh, do that. And then what happens? They go into follow-up mode, right? So, but the politically correct term of this, follow-up mo mode, it's called chase mode. That's what it is. I mean, you can call it follow-up mode, but the politically correct term is called chase mode, right? So you've entered chase mode. And tell me if, you, if this resonates with you. You put on this great presentation, you thought it was had exactly everything they need. During the presentation, they said, oh yeah, this is great. This is exactly what we need. Let me take this presentation, right? Let me take this presentation and bring it back, this proposal, let me bring it back to my Johnny, Sally, Sue, my partners. We're gonna talk about it. 
And then we're going to come back to you. Oh, but they're going to love this. They're going to love this. Right. So. So you're, you're waiting and then and then you don't care for them. Right. You don't care from them. So you're following up. Right. And what that means is you're kind of like buzzing around in their inbox, right? You're buzzing around in their email inbox. Hey, John, did you get a chance to read the proposal, right? But in too many cases, this, this ends, this ends in it not going anywhere. Oftentimes is when you come to this motion, a lot of, for a lot of salespeople, it just doesn't kind of go anywhere, right? So really my question for you is, and you can type this in the chat, does this process, is this drastically different than what any of you are following? And it may be drastically different, but is it generally much different than the process that you're following now? For some people, it may not be. And for some, and, and for, for many, it is. For, for many very highly intelligent, very motivated uh, salespeople, very uh, equipped with all the things they need to be to be effective and efficient, I'm telling you, this is what 99% of people do, right? So this is the typical sales process that everybody follows. This is the typical process that everybody follows. Now, this is a great process, right? But the problem is, well, it's not a great process. And the, and, and the reason why it's not a great process is because people think that putting hours and hours into putting together demos beautiful proposals, wonderful quotes. They think that the features and benefits are what make people buy. Why wouldn't it? Why wouldn't the features and benefits? Oh, our company can do this. We're the best at this. We're the lowest price at this. We have, we can do this, 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 that. Like, right, why wouldn't someone talk about features and benefits? But problem is, is that process, that process that 99% of people are doing, that worked in 1950. That actually worked uh, in 1990. It worked in 2010. It even worked in 2019. But we, the we're in a different era of selling now. So we need to update our processes. Bottom line, it doesn't work. So, right? So, but truth be told, if you are willing to sell that way, guess what? The buyer is happy to have this meeting. They are happy to have this meeting. If you want to sell that way, they're happy that. They're not going to stop you. If you want to sell this way, sell this way, right? And, and I'll show you why. So let's look at the typical uh, buyer's order, right? Let's look at the typical buyer's order. So we talked about the seller's order. Now this is the typical buyer's order, right? So the typical buyer's order is here. Let's, let's go from the start. So either you called them, you sent them an email and they're expressing interest, right? They say, yeah, sure. Yeah, sure. Let, let, let's talk. Whatever you just sent me sounds good. I'm going to express interest and uh, let's, let's get on, let's get on a call, right? So they're going to, they're going to act, they're going to get on a call and then you're going to go in the call. So in the call, they're going to be acting, they're, you're going to be telling them all the great things that you do. You can solve this. I can do that. We can do this for you. We have the best this. We have the lowest cost that. We can get this done exactly the way you want it when you want it, right? Hey, that sounds great. So they're going to act motivated, right? They're going to act motivated. They're going to act motivated. Right? So they're going to act motivated. Now, the next thing they're going to do is because they're really motivated, right? You're going to, you as the seller is, Hey, there must be really motivated. This is going to go somewhere. So they're going to try to get information from you. So what they're going to do is they're going to att attempt to gain as much information from you as possible. Now, what does that information look like? That's a quote. That's a demo. That's a proposal. That's a, 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 a document with all the things that you say that you're going to do how you're going to do those things, when you're going to do those things, and the cost of all those things, right? So this is, what is this? Obtaining information. That's super valuable. That's really valuable for the buyer, right? Right? So now, so they're going to obtain this information, right? And the thing is, now you're going to do like, a, now they're, what they're going to do is they're going to kind of avoid once they got this commission, once they got this information, they're going to go back and say, I'm going to go back and talk to Sally, Sue, John, Joe, whatever. I'll get back to you in a couple of days, right? 
Now, the next step is there, you know, you're going to say, okay, I, let, I sent you this proposal. What do you think about this proposal, right? You liked it? Yeah, sure. I liked it, but let me just get back to you. So that's what they're going to do. They're going to avoid commitment. They're going to avoid any type of commitment. They got everything that they needed. They're going to avoid commitment. So then what, what happens? They're going to disappear. Or you're going to call them and they're not going to call back. You're going to send them emails. They're not going to get back, right? They're, that's That's really kind of... That's the typical order, right? Because they're used to the sales process that 99% of salespeople do. And I'm going to show you the dynamic of these two processes, the seller's process and the buyer's process and how that, how that kind of looks. But the fundamental problem is that with that process, that seller's process that I showed you, the buyer has a ton of experience handling that type of process. They've been, because that's how most people sell. They have that sell. They, they have, that's how most people sell. So they know the seller's process. So that's why they've developed this process, right? This is the process that they've developed to counteract the process that you have, have put them through, right? So before we get into the details of that, I want to ask you all a question. And you can answer this in the chat. So if the prospect, was never going to be to buy. Let's say they were never even going to buy what you have in the first place. Why would they let you do this? So why would they let you go through that sales process that we just showed you? Why would they let you do that if they were never going to buy in the first place? Why would they let you give them all that information? Okay. So Taha is saying is they they want to shop uh, they want to shop around. Dan is saying fear of missing out. Kathy is saying so that they can compa can compare your product or service. People are saying to compare their uh th their their options, right? Conrad is saying to validate their current preferred vendor, right? Right. Good good res good responses. Harley's saying to match perhaps with their current event uh, vendor. That's right. That's right. So now let's look at how this actually works while, while you're going together, right? Like I said, if you're willing to sell this way, if you are willing to sell this way, then they're gonna they're gonna take this way. So let's start here. So they act interested. Basically, they act interested. So that means you as the seller, they think they're interested. So let me do a needs analysis, right? So you do the needs analysis, they get you get basic high level information enough to think that they're interested. So they act motivated, right? So they're acting motivated. So you put on a proposal, you spend hours potentially with some some types in some types of selling. It can take hours, can take weeks, can even take months, and it could take multiple people putting two quotes together. Right? You have the selling team, you could have the tech team, you could have the, 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 the reps team. Sometimes there's three to four people involved in putting one quote together. And it can take hours to do this, right? So you're going to put all this information together and they're going to get this information, right? This super valuable information that they're not even paying for. They're not even paying for. You're literally giving them the answers. <laughs> like that's what it is, right? And then because you gave them this information, you're going to attempt to close. You're going to attempt to close. You're going to be, end up chasing them. And then they're going to, you're going to ask them for a close. They're going to avoid commitment. I got to take this back to Sally Sue. Take this back to Joe. Take this back to John. Let me get back to you. This is great. This is great, right? And the thing is, they know that you're a sale, you are a professional salesperson. They know that you are able to handle objections. They already know that you have all the tips and tricks and all the statements to, to come back to them to handle objections. So in order to because they know that's what the sellers do, and they're not doing this maliciously, by the way. The buyer is not doing this in a malicious way. They're just trained because that's how 90% of sellers, sellers do. So they're trained, and this is because they don't trust you. Why are they doing it this way? Why is, this, why is the buyer doing these things? It's because they don't trust you, period, right? And so because they don't trust you, they think that if they give you any type of objection, or if they tell you no, or if they say this is not the time or whatever, they're either going to, they're either too nice to say no. They don't want to hurt your feelings, right? But let's, how, let's make this even worse. 
What happens if they already have, the, what, if, what happens if they already know who they're working with? They already know who they're working with. It's, but their boss told them they're, they have to get three quotes to confirm that they already are, to confirm the person that they're already working with, right? So that could be that. They're getting a quote to confirm that even though they already chose a company, a great company, they just need to get a quote just because their boss told them to. Or maybe they're taking that quote, they're gonna take this quote and find out if they can do it on their own. Or they're gonna take this quote, like people said, and they're gonna shop it to the competition. Or they're gonna take this quote and see if they can get it at a cheaper price or find someone else that can do it, right? But bottom line is, the reason that they're they're avoiding commitment is because they're they're too nice to say no. They've already made their choice. They're shopping around to the competition, or they're trying to get free consulting, right? And again, this is not malicious. They're not doing this on purpose. Every buyer does this. I do it. You do it. Why? Because you don't trust the salesperson. Because what ninety nine percent of people do is they try to handle, do, say all these tips and tricks, manipulative tactics. Um, features and benefits try to convince, right? They try to convince and persuade. So in order to avoid all that BS, BS, right? They're going to be nice, right? So you're going to handle the objections. You're going to do that. And then they're going to disappear. They're just going to disappear. Why? Because they don't, they, they got everything they need. So they're going to disappear and you're going to try to follow up. You're going to chase them, basically, basically pester them, right? And this happens all the time, right? Why? Because the buyer knows that, knows exactly how to gather information. They know how to gather information, right? And that's another fundamental problem because, because the buyers have tons of experience buy, buying and they know the sales cycle, they're going to use the sales site, this sales process. The, sorry, the buyer knows the sales process of the seller. They're going to use this process against you, right? That's what they're going to do. And what happens in this type of situation, right? What happens in this type of situation? Who wins in this type of situation? Type in the chat quickly, who wins in this type of situation? Is it the buyer or is it the seller in this type of situation who wins? Okay. So me, people are saying the buyer. Well, guess what? No one wins in this situation. The buyer doesn't win and the seller doesn't win. Why? Because let's say, let's say the, the following this process, the buyer got all their information. They found out the cost of everything without really understanding the true value. So they got the cost. So now they're going to take this cost and go shop into the competition and find someone to do it cheaper. But as we know, the cheaper way is not always the best way. Something cheaper, like have you ever presented some really beautiful presentation demo quote only to find that, and you knew it's exactly what the buyer needs. You, 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 you knew their business, you totally understood their business. You presented this quote, you knew it is exactly what they need, but you, you came to found, find that they went with someone else. You went, they went with someone else even though you knew this is exactly what they need. Why? Because they probably found someone that was cheaper, but I guarantee you, it probably isn't, isn't the right op option for them because they're just going off what is cheaper and what they fit, what the salespeople are doing are failing to find what the true needs are, what the true problems are, right? So no one wins in this situation. When it's a race to the bottom, nobody wins. And again, this, we're not talking about commodity sales where we're, we're selling you know, the cheapest product. We're talking about value selling, where we're B2B value selling. So no one wins when you're when you when you follow this process. So who is leading the buyer seller dance, right? Who is leading that dance? Who is leading that dance? Was it the buyer or the seller? Once again, right? The buyer is, right? So that's kind of kind of really important because if you look at that order, their motivation really is to meet you. Their motivation is to, to meet you and to see how you can help. To see how you can help. But the problem with that is, is their motivation before the meeting goes to see how you can help 
to how much free information can I get without making any type of commitment? Why? Because you're following the typical process that 99% of people do that is, man again, this is not intentional, but it comes off as manipulative. No one likes to be sold anything, right? No one likes to be sold anything. So the agenda, the original agenda of the buyer was to see if you can help. And now that you're in the meeting following this process, the agenda has turned to how much free information can I get without making any type of commitment, right? So that's kind of kind of important. So let's uh, let's let's look at that. So again, in that process, no one really no one really wins in that process because the salesperson didn't really the salesperson didn't really find out what the true problem was, right? They didn't really gather the real information to solve the problem. They didn't gather all the information that they needed to solve solve the problem, right? So this can happen. And then when you're not gathering the same information and the, the, the right information that they need, and then the, the, the buyer goes to the, to the cheapest place, right? They're, they're making decisions on the wrong criteria. They're making a decision on price, right? And that's not the best for a lot of instances. So look at this, look at these, uh, look at these questions on the screen. Are salespeople more comfortable giving or gathering information? So let's let's answer that question first. Are salespeople more comfortable, and you can put that in the chat, giving or gathering information? Some people are saying gathering, some people are saying giving. All right. Now, okay. Now are prospects more comfortable giving? or gathering information? Right. So to make it really short, wanna know the true, wanna know the true process, the true buyer's sales process, buyer's process when you sell that way, this is their process. Their process is to lie, right? The process is to lie, act interested. Their second process is to steal, steal information. <laughs> Their third process is to lie, right? This is great. Let me take it back to Sally. And then their fourth process is to disappear. Now, this may be offensive to you, right? This may be offensive, but I'm not here to offend you, right? Again, this is not a malicious thing. They're not doing malicious things. Right. There's it's just the problem was that there was no real understanding of the needs. Right. So if there's no understanding of the needs and you're just preventing solutions, then they're going to steal the information. So it, it's just not helpful for anyone. So if you follow this process, you can be happy to know that the buyer will absolutely accept the sales process. But their process then turns from turns from seeing if you can help to lie, steal, lie, hide. Right. And we do it all the time. I do it, you do it. We don't do it on purpose. It's just, that's the process. Okay, so let's look at some, let's look at some kind of philosophies. Let's look at some philosophies. Sandler rule, no free consulting. So what does that mean to you? Type in the chat, what does free consulting mean to you? When you hear, hear the word of free consulting, what does that mean to you? What does free consulting mean to you? Educating the buyer, yep, Conrad. Harley says giving away information for free. Bahad says, tell me what they need to know. Absolutely, free consulting. You're giving them something that they haven't even committed to yet. Like imagine writing this perfect quote, perfect proposal that has everything they could possibly need to solve their problem and they just got it for you for free. Right. And you think because they did some expressed interest, that means they're going to buy. Absolutely not. Right. Joe says providing valuable information without paying. Right. And this is what most people do. They, and it's not their fault. It's not their fault. Right. This is what most people do. 
Second, look at this, look at this on the screen. So hard selling is good for one thing, hard pushback. Hard selling is good for one thing, hard pushback. So if you go back to this section, attempt to close, handle objections, attempting to close, handling objections. This is when you let everything out. This is what we can do. This is when you, you it's your final moment to, to, to show them that you can help them. That's, a, that's hard selling, right? Hard selling. That's really good if you want to get hard pushback or if you want to get them to lie to you. All right? That's that's beautiful. That's perfect. That's really good to do. So hard selling is good for one thing, hard pushback. Okay? So now look at this slide. The role of the modern salesperson is to create an atmosphere and an environment which allows the customer to buy while the salesperson just gets the heck out of the way, right? Just gets the heck out of the way. Because what happens when you're in a meeting with, this, with a person and they, they say, you know, yeah, for sure, John, thanks for inviting me in this call. I'm happy to find out uh, all the great things that you do, John, in your company. Um, I'm thinking about working with ABC company, but why don't you tell me all the great things that you do and tell me how you're different? Tell me how you're different. Now the salesperson, what's the, what are they going to do? Tell me how you're different. They're immediately going to jump on. Oh, cause we can do this. Oh, cause we can do that. We're different this way. We're different that way. Cause we can provide this. You said you had this concern. Well, we can fix that. Right. That's not helping them buy. That's helping them get free information. And you're also not finding out, just presenting, present, doing presentations, proposal, and just talking about all the great things that you're doing. You're not finding out what their real needs are. You're not finding out what they actually need to see to get to a decision, right? So let's talk about the Sandler selling system. Let's talk about how do we flip it how do we flip it so that we can get the person to, to actually open up so that we can actually have an intelligible conversation, right? Because unless the, the buyer is willing to share with you what's going on, what their real challenges are, you know, what, what their serious problems are that's going on in their day-to-day -day, day life, it, it, how could you possibly be able to provide proper solutions in a way that resonates with them, right? So there's seven steps that we that we do to do that. So first thing is, how do we get them to trust us? Because remember, I said that they 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 do that. They get free information because they don't trust you. Period. They don't trust the sales person. Person. So how can we flip that? And how we can flip that is by being what I like to call disarmingly honest. Disarmingly honest. Right. So the previous situation is you got John on the call. He says to you, tell me how you're different. Tell me all the great things that you can do for me. And uh, I, I, I'm excited to hear. So what 99% of salespeople do is they jump right on it. They jump right on it, right? Now you're in selling mode. You are now in selling mode. So how do we get them? How do we be disarmingly honest? Well, that starts off by setting a clear a clear contract, a clear agenda for the meeting, setting a clear agenda for the meeting. And that includes in this agenda, the prospects agenda, right? The prospects expectations and agenda, the seller's expectations and agenda of this meeting and a mutually agreed upon outcome, right? So you, you have to agree on the outcome. So the typical salesperson is just gonna jump on in and say all the great things that they can do. But in order to flip that, like how can, just, just, just think about this. How can you be with, how can you know with certainty without finding out exactly what they need that you can provide solutions? How could you do that? Think about this, let's use this analogy. Imagine your arm hurts, you, have, you, you hurt your arm. So you go to the doctor. You go to the doctor's office, you say, ow, my arm hurts, doctor, help me. 
So what the doctor does is they're going to do a CAT scan, right? They're going to run a full CAT scan. They're going to do, do an assessment. They're going to do an analysis before they prescribe any type of drug solution, right? You're not just going to go walk into an off, uh, a doctor's office and say, yeah, my arm hurts. And they say, here, take this, take this. That's completely negligent. That's negligent and they should lose their practice. And the same goes for selling. Selling, by the way, is not a soft skill. This is a profession and you must take it seriously. Just like a doctor, lawyer, accountant, uh, tech person, selling is a serious profession and it needs to be taken seriously, right? So how do we flip this so that we can be disarmingly honest, right? So, so Mr. Seller, tell me how you're different. Tell me how you can help us. Well, Mr. Well, Joe, at this point, I don't even know yet. I don't even know if we can help you at this point. Would it be okay if I ask you a couple questions? We ask each other a couple questions to find out what exactly the problem is so that we can find out if I can even help you. Because at this point, I don't know. I, I, I need to ask you a couple questions. I need to find out some information so that I can A, best answer your question and to find out if I can even help you. Because at this point, I don't even know if we're better. We may not be better. Do you mind if I ask you a couple questions, right? So that right there, you, you, the disarmingly honest, the fact that you're, you're being, you, you are moving out of selling mode and into uh, co consultant mode where you're there to help them. What is that? What do you think that does for rapport? What do you think that does for rapport, right? Just type in the chat. What do you think that does for rapport and trust? Hey, John, at this point, I don't know for sure if we can help you. We may not be able to. Do you mind if I ask you a couple questions to find out if I can? What do you think that's going to do for rapport? I'll tell you what it's going to do. It's going to drastically increase rapport. It's going to bring walls down, right? Harley says strengths and bonding and rapport, right? Bonding in rapport, by the way, is not starting the conversation off with, what about those gas prices? Hey, Nancy, how are the kids? Um, how was your day? How are you? Now, those are all great openers, but that's not bonding and rapport. Bonding and rapport is the ability to create comfort. Um, bonding and rapport is to be on the same page, on the same communication page, right? Remember how I talked about in the, in the initial conversation is that the buyer and the seller have conflicting have conflicting agendas. The buyer is here to get information. The buyer here is to it, the buyer wants to get as much information. The seller wants to get as much information. So we need to make sure that we're setting a really good upfront contract before we even talk about anything, so that we know the outcome of the conversation. So we're, we're admitting that we don't know for sure that we can provide the solution, and we're also setting an upfront contract of the call. So the call is not to sell you, Mr. Prospect. The call is to ask each other some questions, find out if it makes sense to talk further. Because at this point, I don't even know, right? So we want to make sure that we're setting up really good upfront contracts, right? Thanks, Harley. Creating a clear guideline of your intentions. That's what Harley said. So the purpose of the purpose of the call for me, the buyer, the agenda for sorry, the purpose of the agenda for the seller, me. The outcome I'm looking for, which is to find out if we should talk further, as well as the purpose of this call for the buyer to ask each other questions and find out if we should be a resource. And the only decision that we want to make at the end of this call, there could be a couple things. First decision is after we have this conversation, if I honestly think that I can't help you, if I, by the way, out of role play guys and girls, if I, the seller, honestly think that I can't help you, I'm going to be upfront about that. Are you okay with that? Get them to confirm. And same with you, Mr. Prospect. If, you, if based after our conversation here today, if you honestly think that we have what we have is not what you need, I want you to feel totally comfortable voicing that. And if that's the case, we'll just shake hands virtually and close your file. Are you comfortable with that? Of course, I'm comfortable with that. Imagine, and imagine a salesperson coming to them saying that we may not be a solution for you. Like, how often does that happen? Rarely ever does that happen, right? So that's the first steps. Now, let's say let's say we got let's say we we get past that. Like how do we how do we 
how does someone have a high, how can we know at, before we get into the sales conversation or as we're in the sales conversation, how can we know before we put on any presentation or proposal if there's a high probability of them actually being a client, right? And that starts here, actual pain. Now, everyone knows, everyone in sales knows that you need to find some segments of pain, right? And by pain, I mean a problem, something that is costing them something, whether it's costing them revenue, it's costing them margin, um, it's costing them time, it's costing them resources. There's got to be some, it's, it, 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 it's an emotion, something emotionally it's costing them, right? Because without any type of emotion, people aren't going to move. You would think that logically, here, Mr. Buyer, I have all the logical answers for you. You would think that presenting them these logical answers that it would make them move, it absolutely will not. Because people make people come to decisions first by emotion, and they confirm that they confirm that emotion with logic, right? So it, it's not starting off with logic, then emotion. We need to get some type of emotion running here first before we can confirm with logic the solutions, right? So actual pain, right? So what is the actual pain? The actual pain right here is, this is where, so you had permission to ask questions, right? They said you can ask me questions. So this is where we need to find out actual pain. People rush too quick. They start because they, they, they think because someone says, hey, yeah, I'm looking for this, or we need that. They think that's a good semblance of pain. No, right? So they think because they said that, they're going to rush to proposal. They're going to rush to a sell, right? No, we're not even, we're, in order to get to some type of decision and, and fulfillment, which is, is the, the presentation right here, we, we can't get there until we worked through these, these areas. Until each one of these areas, one of these one, two, three, four, five is completed, we are not putting on any presentations or proposals, right? So for pain, right? So here, here, here is what constitutes their pain so that we can move into the budget step. First is they actually have to have a problem, right? Obviously, they have to have a problem and they have to give you examples of the problem. It's not just saying what the problem is. They need to give you examples, right? So not only do they have a problem, they, they, they potentially may not know why the problem exists, right? What is the reason for this problem? They may not know, or they're gonna tell you why. What is the reason this problem exists, right? And they also have to think that they don't already have a solution, right? They, may, they have to not have a solution. Real pain means you have a problem and you don't have a solution, right? If you have a problem, but you already have a solution, then you don't really have real pain. Or if you have a problem and they're, and they're about to roll out a solution, let's say they tell you what that solution is, is and you know, in their, you know that that solution is not going to fix. But in their mind, they do. They think that that solution is going to fix it. Therefore, they don't have real pain because they have a solution, right? If you have a solution, then you don't have real pain. You only have real pain if you have a solution, right? Or they could have a problem, but... If they're already working with an incumbent, if they're already working with someone else fixing this problem, why would they switch to you, right? Why are they gonna switch to you if they already have someone fixing this problem? Again, there's no pain there, right? So, so the pain is they're also thinking about how much is this problem costing me in time, money, and emotion, right? They gotta be frustrated, right? So if someone's in pain, they're frustrated, they're concerned, they're not satisfied, they're not happy, these are the emotions that they feel. No one is excited to spend money and fix problems. And, and, and no one is excited to just spend money, right? If ever someone is really excited to spend money, then th it's probably not that big of a problem, right? So that's the first thing. So, right? So th they, if they don't, bottom line is if they don't have a problem that is costing them time, money, resources, emotion, whatever, then it's not a real prospect, okay? So let's say we've got that semblance of pain. Let's say we've gotten through that semblance of pain. Time, there's a time issue, there, so that they have problems with whatever it is, they've confirmed that problem. Now let's get into the budget. Again, we are still not presenting anything. We're not even really talking about what we do at this point because we're leading the conversation. We need to get answers answered before we can provide solutions. So now budget. 
So let's say we got through pain. Now we're in budget, right? What type in the chat when you think of budget? What are the elements of budget? What is budget, right? What does budget mean to you? Type in the chat. What does budget mean to you? When you think of budget, what does it mean to you? Cost. Conrad says cost, right? Cost. Upfront costs, ongoing costs, says Kathy. Okay, right. Okay. So, yeah, it's it's cost, but there's way more to budget than cost, right? You can't tell me that it's just money that is is, is a budget, right? Right. Eric says uh, dedication to money resources. Right. Okay. So budget is time, money, resources, and whatever is involved to fix the problem. Also, who's going to be involved? Are they going to get rid of their incumbent? Now, let's go back to time, money, and resources. So you could be talking to a prospect. And they could have the time. Oh, they have tons of time to Im implement this. Got tons of time to implement this. But they don't have the funding available. Well, if they have the time, but they don't have the funding, why are we moving on to any next steps if they can't afford it, right? Why would we start talking about solutions if they can't afford it, right? Because it's not just the willing, it's the able. It's the willing, the budget is the willingness and also ability, right? So let's say they have the time, they don't have the money. Disqualified for now, right? Disqualified for now. Let's say they have the money, but they don't have the time. They have the money and resources, but they don't have the time to implement it. Disqualified. Like, how are they gonna find, like if they're at capacity, how, how could they possibly add this into their repertoire of business dealings? If they're already at capacity and don't have the time, like how can they do that? Right. How are they going to be able to do that? So we want to really be able to find this out before we're presenting any solutions. So budget is the, the ability and the willingness. It's not just the ability, but it's also the willingness. Time, money, re resources, timing, willingness to change, dedication to change. That's budget. That's part of budget. Now, let's say we get past pain and budget. Now let's get into the decision step, the decision step here, right? So they got the pain, they have the time, money and resources confirm and you confirm that. And you've also confirmed that they're going to get rid of their incumbent. Let's say they said that because if they have someone they're already working with and they say that they're not gonna get rid of them, like we're done here. Or if they have someone that they're working with and they're already giving them everything they want, then what, what, what are we talking about? You're gonna convince them? You're going to try to convince them otherwise, right? But let's say, let, let's say we go back. Let's say, let's say we, 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 we've confirmed time, money, resources, the willingness and the ability. Now we're in decision. So in the decision steps, right? We have, we as this, we as the seller, we have our, we have our ways to decide if this is a fit or not, such as can we, can we implement it in the time they want? Can we implement it in their budget? Can we do all the things that they want us to do, right? And say we've confirmed that. But they also have their decision making process. They have their process by which they make decisions. They're, what are all, and, and their process is what are all the steps that they need to go through to get to a decision? What are the steps from here right now in this call to the point where they're, they've paid and implementing the process? What are all the steps that need to be completed before we get to that? And that's the decision, right? So what do they need to go through? Who is involved? What is the timeline between each event, each step that, that needs to occur and the t for the problem to be removed? What is the who, the what, the where, the who does what, when do they do this by? All those steps, what are those steps in order to get a confirmation, right? Because and, and, and right, so we need to get this timeline sorted out because you may go through the pain and budget step, but when it comes to actual the decision step, you may realize that uh, no, they want that they need this in a time that I can't fulfill. So yeah, they got the pain, they got the money, the resources, the willingness, but in the decision, you realize that all the things that need to happen, I can't fulfill it by the time you want it. That could be an issue, 
or maybe in this decision step, after, after they, you've gone through pain, you've gone through budget in this decision step, you realize that maybe they realize, oh, oh crap, maybe I'm not ready to actually come to a decision. Maybe I need to do all these things first before I can actually get to a decision. Maybe all these things need to happen first before I can get to a decision. And the, before, until these things happen, I can't get to a decision, right? So what is their decision-making process? The who, the what, the when, the time and the timing that needs to happen to get to each decision. And that's why it's really important to fish this timeline out because going into it, they themselves may realize that this is not a good time, which is good for you, right? And also going into it, you may realize that they can't, you, you can't do what they need, right? So you wanna be able to make sure that you're finding all of this stuff out before you put on any types of presentations and proposals, because you could get in the trap of, because they gave you some high level needs indication, you could get in the trap of thinking that you got enough information and it's now time to put on a presentation. But unfortunately, the information that you were getting from them was not the real information that you needed to, to, to come to a decision, right? Because a Sandler rule is, here's a Sandler rule for you. The problem that the prospect comes to you with is rarely the real problem. It's rarely the real problem. It could be a high level service problem. It could be a problem, but it's rarely the real problem. So you want to make sure that you are fishing through these steps so that you can find out it like, is this actually going to go anywhere? Right. So before you put on any type of presentation and proposal. So therefore, go back to this question. Go. OK, it's at the beginning, but going back to the question, how would you how could you close? Question was at the beginning. How how could you close more business after a presentation and proposal? It's by doing this. It's by finding out these steps first, so that by the time you're getting to any type of presentation or proposal, it's you're you're basically sold because they are telling you exactly what needs to go in to the presentation or proposal in order to get to a yes. It's not you presenting them with what you think they need. It's them, based on these conversations, telling you exactly what they need to see, when they need to see it, how they need to see it in order to get to a yes, if it's going to be a yes. Or you could go through these steps and realize that, hey, I'm not gonna waste 20 hours putting together a proposal that's not even gonna land. I'm not just gonna start, I'm not just gonna, whoever's expressed interest, whoever gives me a basic needs analysis, I'm gonna go on my computer and start putting proposals again, thinking that they're gonna love it, right? So how can we close more business in the proposal stage? It's by doing a, a better job at finding the pain, budget, and decision. So by the time we're actually getting into fulfillment, which is a presentation, it's it's basically sold, right? It's basic. It's basically sold. And in nowhere, anywhere, are you convincing convincing them of anything? They are telling you everything. And it's because you asked for permission to ask questions, and you started asking questions instead of just spewing out features and benefits for things that may not even be relevant to what they need, right? So when we come to the fulfillment stage. 21st century sellers, modern sellers, people that are hot, that do value selling that are very successful in their selling roles, they know that in order to justify putting together a presentation, demo, or proposal, they know that they need to obtain all this information in advance of any presentation, demo, or proposal. Because if they can get this information in advance, probability of closing goes way up, right? It, the, their, their closing ratios go up. Now they may be putting out less quotes and proposals than what they're used to, but their closing ratios are going up, right? So, and then you may say, and then you may say, okay, well now that another, another common theme is, 
once you made the sale, just, just shut up. Don't say anything else. Just, you might screw up the sale. Once they said that, yes, I'm going to, I'm going to buy it. Don't say anything so that you don't screw up the sale. Right. That's like a typical thing is just get out of there. Right. I'm telling you to not do that because that's where the post sell comes. This is the post sell. So let's say they said, yes, I want to buy this. Send me over everything. The post sell is to really confirm that this is going to go somewhere. Go it, go back to their initial, what were their initial objections? Mr. Prospect, you initially said that this, this, that might be a problem. After we've discussed about this, has anything changed? Do you still think that this, this, and that is going to be a problem about this, about our process, right? So, because you want to confirm that, like handle the objections now before the call ends and they come back and say, actually, I don't want to do this, right? Handle the objections before money is, is brought across the table. Because the last thing you want to do is have to issue a, a refund or you know a, a, a credit memo or something like that. Because everyone experiences buyer's remorse, especially when you're dealing with large ticket items. Everyone experiences buyer's remorse. So you want to handle that buyer's remorse right now. And handling that buyer's remorse is not going to push them away. Because if you got all these steps right here, it's, it's done, right? It's basically done. Handle buyer's remorse before they actually come to you with the problem. Okay. So again, never get in between the buyer and where you want them to go. Never get in between a buyer and where you want them to go. And how you do that is by finding out what are the real problems. Not just the problem that they presented to you, but what are the real problems? Now that you got that problem, is this a big enough solution to actually do something about it? Yes, it's a big enough issue to do something about it. Okay, who is involved? What do you need to see? What are all the steps that need to happen, right? And here's another thing. You can't sell anybody anything until they discover they want it. So your typical convincing, persuading process, it's not gonna fly. They may, you may, they may show you in the meeting, but once that meeting's over, they're gone, right? So that's why, like, we really want to make sure that the, the focus is on, on their problems and that you're making sure that you are leading this discussion and you can lead this discussion in a very comfortable way. They'll be very happy for you to lead as long as you're setting really good upfront contracts about the what you're, what's going to happen in that meeting. Because if you ask for permission to ask questions and they said yes, you got to ask questions, right? So don't feel like it's uh, I'm intrusive or I'm pushy when I'm asking questions. If they've said that you can do that, then you can do that. And they want you to do that, right? Because most people don't ask questions. They just spew out features and benefits. So bottom line is it's value selling. We're, that's that's what it is. And uh, that's basically it. So that was a bit of an abrupt stop, but uh, let's uh, share feedback. We have a couple minutes here now and then we're gonna end this, but uh, feedback in the chat. Wow, Justine, that was incredible. Like I'm, I'm literally sitting here taking it all in. It was just so, so great. And I, you know, I look at like that last note in particular, that last rule where we can't sell anybody anything until they discover they want it was just like, for me, that was the, you know, real right. icing on top, you know, all, all the rules that you placed in today were just valuable and helpful to all of our, our clients. It was just, you know, incredible insight. And I, mm -hmm. I just want to take that this moment to thank, thank you for that. You know, it was such a great instruction on how to approach sales. And, and as they say, opportunities don't happen, you create them. Mm -hmm. I think today you demonstrated a system that will enable us and our clients to go out and create these opportunities. And, uh, and by doing so in a different way than they've done in the past, right? Taking that dance and changing the way the steps happen is, is a pretty intriguing um you know, prospect. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm looking at the time. I don't know that we have a, enough time for 
questions today, but there is a few spots um, for uh, you know office hours with Justine tomorrow. Um, so you know, I, I'm sure your minds, like everybody's minds, are probably just racing with questions right now. So, you know, the Justine's put aside some time for our clients tomorrow for 15 minute consultations with her between nine and 12. There are some spots left. So you can use the link in the chat uh, that just Sarah just dropped in there uh, to register for some one-on-one -on -one time. So keep, you know, bring those questions tomorrow. And, you know, you can also reach out to our venture growth team who can make a warm introduction to Justine to, you know, continue the conversation. Um, so on behalf of Tech Alliance, I want to thank you all for joining us and be sure to check out all of our upcoming events at techalliance.ca, including the fireside chat on robotics later this month and our holiday mixer on December 13th called Jingle and Mingle. We hope to see you there and we look forward to uh, spending more time with you. Once again, Justine, thank you for your time. Thanks, and, Karen. Thanks for having me. I appreciate yeah, it. so, you know, keep up the good work, uh, all of you, and sit, be, stay safe, be well, take good care of yourself and each other. Thanks so much. Be well. Bye.